Hi, uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, officially, I think the title is A Practical Supply Chain Hack, Blinking RGBs for Fun and Profit. I prefer um, just thinking of it as the shaggy dog hacking story, and you'll see why. Uh, who am I? I'm Dale. Um, I'm by day a team lead and senior software developer at Structurate, uh, building big data things. In my free time, I take a lot of stuff apart, and I'm probably most famous for tweeting lots and lots of pictures of homemade pizza. Um, <clears throat> I'm also a regular speaker here at B-Science, and uh, I've spoken at DevConf, and I always describe myself as a jack-of-all-trades serial skill collector and high-functioning hoarder. I always tell the joke. I'm not too sure about that high-functioning part. I'm not a nation-state hacker. I'm not employed by a three-letter agency. I'm not here to sell you anything, tools, services, or anything like that. I'm not even in InfoSec. Um, whoops. And <clears throat> I'm just a guy who takes things apart. <laughs> if you were at the three-letter agency, would, would I tell you? Tell I don't know, maybe. Um, <clears throat> this talk is not about scaring you, it's about showing you a whole new world. So uh, what is the supply chain? That's sort of the fancy version, but basically you can think of it as the process that uh, is required to take something from a manufacturer to an end, end person. And I always like to think of it uh, uh, blurring those lines slightly and thinking of it as there's a mini supply chain when I place an order on take a lot that takes the item from the take a lot warehouse and delivers it to my house and that kind of thing. Now, what is a supply chain hack? The idea here is you intercept this somewhere along the line and you do something to the thing and you hack it so that you can gain credentials through it, uh, so that you can take over something, those kind of things. Now, uh, in 2018, I gave a lightning talk with the catchy title called Let's Talk Implants When Size Matters. And what happened was this talk was all about this. I don't remember if anyone remembers this. This was like the big news. Supposedly, some Chinese hackers had put a little thing on a motherboard somewhere, and they were stealing all the things. And these boards were in AWS and Azure and Google, and it was the end of the world and everything else. And I think about six months later, it all vanished and nothing really happened. Um, but like I say, these supply chain hacks have been around for a long time. In the Cold War, in the 1970s, the Russians modified typewriters. So what they did was these were typewriters being used by the US Embassy, and they essentially put a bug inside the typewriter so that it could track every key that you pressed, and it would beam them to a little van outside, and then they knew what was being done. Um, the NSA turned this into essentially a mini covert business. Um, they had, this is a picture from their Ant catalog. Uh, it's an awesome browse through if you do find it. Got leaked uh, quite a while ago now. Um, but this has got a whole bunch of these cool little bug-like devices that allow you to catch what's flowing through USB cables, what's, um, they've got special things that you can put into certain models, the Cisco router, and all this kind of thing. And again, the idea here is you, you pick up the device before it reaches the endpoint, and you go and shove your little thing inside, and then you can capture, again, credentials, secrets, whatever you want to, or you can insert your own into the thing, and you capture it that way. Um, the NSA did this. Um, this one's kind of well known. Um, they upgraded a bunch of Cisco hardware that was meant for certain people. And uh, in this case, they just patched the firmware. So what they would do is they'd intercept the deliveries, patch them, rebox them up, and then ship them out to the client. And again, it allowed them a backdoor into various systems. So my question has always been, can I build one of these things? Can I do this? So like I say, I don't do this because it's easy, um, because I thought it would be. So um, yeah, let's, let's try do this. So I've got some basic constraints. It needs to be cheap. I need minimal tools and equipment and skills to be able to do this. It needs to be easily reproducible. I don't want to have something where you need a special set of things. And it needs to be really hard to detect, ideally. It needs to be practical. It needs to be something I could do or that someone in this audience could do. I don't want it to be something that, like, I, you need electron microscopes or scanning electron beams and all kinds of other crazy equipment or um, custom fab house to make your little implant chips. And most importantly, I need to be able to sneak it past my wife. 
Because if I buy any more electronics or any more tools, she's going to kill me. So I've got a few simple, simple questions here. Hands up. Who of you has used a wireless USB keyboard? OK, great. Who's typed something on the keyboard they need to keep secret? OK. And who of you would like a free RGB gaming keyboard? <laughs> yeah, exactly. OK, so why keyboards? They're cheap. Uh, they're easily available. Everyone uses them. You type your secrets on them. And most importantly, my wife won't find a few of them arriving too suspicious. Uh, after she sees this, she's going to change her mind. So this is how a modern keyboard works. Okay, I know I've simplified it a lot, but basically, it's got a bunch of switches. And those switches are hooked up to a little chip. And that little chip's also normally hooked up to a bunch of blinky lights. And then the USB is hooked up to that. And all this chip does is it scans through these things, works out which buttons have been pushed, translates that into USB hit commands, uh, which is called, uh, stands for USB what human interface device, I think it is, and then sends those across out the USB. So when you push a button on your keyboard, all you're doing is closing a switch. And like I said, the little chip does all this translating. Now, in the old days, long time ago, 20, 30 years ago, those chips had no software on them. They were hard-coded, they were built, they were shipped like that, and you couldn't change what's on them. The thing is, nowadays, that's expensive, and it's cheap to have microcontrollers that can run code. It's cheaper to do that than custom electronics. The other thing is, people want features. People want blinking lights. You want gaming macros that you can program onto your keyboard. You want all those nice new features. And so, it's gotten cheaper just to put a random chip into one of these keyboards and ship it out. So here's my plan. I'm going to change the firmware on the chip. I'm then going to put that chip back into the keyboard. I'm then going to ship that keyboard to some unsuspecting person, perhaps someone who attends my talk, and then something's going to happen and I'm going to make money. This is a brilliant idea, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, how hard could it be? Like I say, every one of my talks probably has the slide in it. So now we get to part two, and this is why I've called it the, the shaggy dog story. Most of the time, I always think that all my projects, all my talks go A to B. It's a simple, straight line. I come up with the idea, and it works. In reality, it looks more like that. And as you see, we didn't come out at B. We came out at X, which is just slightly adjacent. So this whole talk got started because of this keyboard. It's the Fox Ray Kronos keyboard. It's about 200 and something rand at the time on Take A Lot. I bought it because I wanted to try out one of these smaller keyboards. And it's OK. I don't know much about keyboards. It goes clicky, clicky when I type. And I liked it. It just had one problem. The keyboard mapping is stupid. So if you want to use the arrow keys, you have to press multiple keys multiple times to put it into arrow key mode, and then you can't get it out. And it gets really frustrating trying to use this thing. So I thought, well, I'll do what I normally do. I'll open it up, and I'll see if I can change that. So I took this thing apart, and I do this for pretty much all the electronics I buy nowadays. I take things. They arrive in my house, I test them out, and the next thing I do is I open them up and take photos inside. Just so that I have a record and I start Googling it. So this is the processor on this particular keyboard. Um, I say it appears to be made by this mysterious company called Shine Tech. I can't find anything about this thing. I can find that out about this other chip, which is also made by them and carries a similar name, but everything about this chip's a mystery. Um, and there's a bunch of other people who are also looking for it. And every time I've tweeted and asked about this chip, everyone refers me back to that same data sheet. I think I've now got like 40 people told me about that same lonesome sheet. And yes, for those of you who want to use the AI tools, ChatGPT doesn't seem to understand this either and doesn't can't find me a data sheet. What's worse is I can't find a software update from Foxray. So part of the other way you can do this is you can get the software update and you can reverse engineer the software update and you can build your own thing and maybe figure out the architecture and things like that and you can go that way to building it. But like I say, no one seems to release one for this. If you happen to ever come across any software for this particular keyboard, in particular one that does a firmware update, please let me know. I've got a few keyboards now with this chipset. Um, I won't give you an exact number of how many keyboards because my wife's going to look at this talk. Um, so while Googling, I stumbled across QMK. 
For those of you, if you've ever built a custom keyboard, you'll know about this project. It runs on Arduinos, Teensies, and the Raspberry Pi Pico. And these crazy people who wire their own keyboards love this software. So what it allows you to do is you put this on the chip, and you wire up your own keyboard thing, and then you can type and you can build your own keyboard. Now, I'm lazy, um, so I haven't bothered trying to build my own keyboard, but I stumbled across the software. In Googling, I also found this. Now, this is a port of QMK to the Sonics microcontroller, in particular the Sonics SN32 microcontroller, which is an ARM Cortex-M0. It's a seriously powerful chip for what it's doing. Um, it's got plenty of storage and everything else. And the Sonics QMK project supports uh, key keyboards by Keychron um, and Red Dragon, along with a few other um, manufacturers. Not all of their keyboards, but any of the USB keyboards. Um, the ones that use Bluetooth use a completely different one. And I did find there's a project called, I think it's called ZMK, which is based on Zephyr. Um, which, allow, which supports some of the Bluetooth ones. Um, now, when I was saying about the controller, this is what happens, and this is why it's so hard to figure out what, who makes what. On the left there is the branding of the chips. So, for example, eVision, HFD, and Sonics are the three manufacturers that um, the Sonics QMK supports. And then you've got the chipsets, uh, the next column there, and then, but those are actually all SN32 microcontrollers. What's happened is the company Sonix has basically licensed or sold or they've been swept from the factory floor, no one really knows, and those chips make their way out to these other ones branded as something else. And people have just found this by pure luck and that. Um, some of these you will find data sheets for, some you won't, some you can find information about, some you can't. Um, and it's all sort of, um, you know, tea leaves in a teacup, crystal ball, go stare at the sky and take a guess. Um, there's not a lot of, like, hard concrete information out there. Um, so, like I say, QMK supports, or Sonic's QMK supports the Red Dragon keyboard. So I thought, well, I'll go buy this keyboard. This is similar to that Foxray one, but the nice thing is it supports QMK. This will be a fun thing. And I had it in the back of my mind, I could turn it into a bit of a talk maybe for B-Science or something like that. This will be a fun project. So I bought one of these keyboards. And it's nice. This is one problem. So it uses the Vision VS11K28A, which it turns out isn't supported by Sonic's QMK. And the only reason I discovered that is, you see the W at the end there? Yeah, this is a new model. So what happened was, to cut costs, they put a different chip in this thing, and so now it's all different. And there's no data sheets for this BSK11. So now what? So like I say, I, different keyboard, I can't make that happen. All I can find online is hints that this chip is an 8051 based chip, but that's about it. And there's no software updates available for the Red Dragon K630W. There is for the K630, but that's the old model of the keyboard, not the new one. It's okay, I, um, I'm good at Google, so I found this file. This is a software update for a totally different model of Red Dragon keyboard, but it happens to use the same chipset. So I took that, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll run it. What could go wrong? So I ran it on my machine, with the keyboard plugged in stupidly, and guess what it did? It immediately put the keyboard into bootloader mode. And I can't get it out of bootloader mode because the software is different. And if I unplug the keyboard and plug it back in, it remembers it's in bootloader mode, so now I have a 300 and something rand keyboard that I've already opened and taken apart and put back together, stuck in bootloader mode. I don't think take a lot's gonna want to take it back, especially not after I've spoken about yet. So, okay, but when I plug it in, it shows up now as this micro dear CH555, and it no longer mentions eVision. Okay, well, let's Google that. So WCH is a company, they manufacture chips, and they're probably best known if you mess around with Arduino and things like that, they're best known for the CH343G, which is this USB to serial translate, uh, serial converter. Um, WCH have a whole range of these microcontrollers that they sell, some are based on RISC-V, some are co co <coughs> ARM Cortex-M microcontrollers. And unfortunately, the one that I have, the CH555, 
is none of those. It's a 8051, or in, precisely it's an enhanced 8051, which means they threw a few extra instructions in and it runs a little bit faster, but otherwise it's based on tech from sort of the 80s. Um, it's not listed anywhere on their site, but in theory, from what I've found, it is supported by SDCC, which is an open source compiler for a C compiler. So in theory, I could write software for this thing. So this is now sort of where I'm sitting, is, okay, so what's next? Well, it's simple. I'll reverse engineer the software update, um, and then I'll figure out the protocol to program the keyboard, then I'll find and set up the build environment, and then I'll reverse engineer the keyboard wiring, and I'll write some new firmware. That's my plan. Problem is, I had to speak yeah because I had already submitted the talk, and I didn't have a lot of time. And I do own a flux capacitor. I have a box, broken ones. Unfortunately, some idiot went and put, wrote basic to run on these things, so um, they don't work properly. OK, so what do you do when you need to now have a talk and you don't have enough time? Well, it's simple. You pivot your talk. Now, like I say, I am a high-functioning hoarder. I have lots and lots of junk. And like all of us, I have boxes of these things. So if I went and rummaged around my boxes, and I found this, the Marvo K6901. Now, I bought this keyboard for 59 Rand. I was actually chatting to Steve, and I see it's actually 49, not 59, at Cash Converters about three years ago. I have no idea why I bought it. I say, for reasons. I bought it because there was a mechanical keyboard, and it looked like it could be useful at some point, and it was cheap, so it came home with me. It's been in that cupboard for a while, um, but... Uh, but I did my usual thing. I'd taken it apart and I'd taken photos of the inside, so I knew more or less what was in it. And the good thing is, it's got a Vision K VS11K15A, which is based on the Sonics 32F268 ARM Cortex M0 board, which is supported by Sonics QMK. Okay, so now I can use the Sonics um, bootloader app that comes. Flash app, and I can put the keyboard into bootloader mode. I can then upload a specific bootloader. So what happens is they've written their own bootloaders for these chips because the ones that got shipped with the chips are very, very dodgy, and so they recommend you use their one. I did have to do a bit of messing about, and I will share all the code, but I had to change things because their app doesn't support this keyboard. Um, but I've managed to do that, and I managed to get a bootloader onto it, which is great. Then. I spent many, many hours listening to sea shanties with my multimeter, carefully figuring out which wires connect to which parts. So this is one of the most important things you have to do when you're trying to reverse engineer these keyboards is you have to figure out which switch goes to where, and you build this whole matrix of all these things. And once you've got that, you can convert that over into code. So OK. Now what? So once I've done this, I built my firmware. and. I now have firmware working on this device. But that's kind of boring, right? So what I did then was I thought, well, what about this idea? What happens if I ship you a keyboard with a key logger in it, and I log every single keystroke you press? Now, normally this would be hard to do, but I've got a keyboard, and you're going to type stuff on it, so all I need to do is log it. So the cool thing is Sonic's QMK is really, really easy to add stuff to. So what I did here is on every key press, I take the key that you've pressed, and I write it to a variable in memory. And that's it. And then, when you press a magic key string, I dump all those keys back out the, the thing. So now what happens is it means that you can type a message on your keyboard, and I can say, turn up a little capacitor thing, and I can say, please type magic string here, and I can then send all the keys that you've pressed back through that little window and send it off to my website. And you won't know this has happened other than the fact that I've typed all the keys. But if you're not looking, you don't see this. And remember, I've made no hardware modifications to this keyboard. All I've done is replace the firmware on it. That's it. Now, in theory, I could have done this to my Red Dragon keyboard as well, but I just don't have time to do it. But as long as you've got the data sheets, you could do this to most USB keyboards. And there's no way to find out that it's been done, because none of the software, there's no keys, there's no protection, there's no digital signing of the firmware, there's nothing. You don't, like, no one even publishes any of this information. So 
you wouldn't know if the keyboard you have right now has a built-in keylogger. There's no way to tell. So, okay, let's try and do this live. Now, please, those of you, if we can make some sacrifices to the demo gods, let's see if this works. Um, okay. So, I'm going to take my little trusty keyboard here. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do this sideways, but... Uh, Hello world. Okay, there we go. I've typed something. So now we put in my magic key code. Um, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, A, B. Oh no. Ah, there we go. And there's all the keys I pressed. Now I can just take this. And I can say, well, let's call it uh, bsides.txt. And I can just run. Uh, don't type live. So there is all my key presses decoded. As you can see, this is space, uh, space, test, hello world, and it's even decoded my magic key string. And there we go. So like I say, um, that's it. Can this be improved? So at the moment, I'm only logging 100 keys. The problem is I have limited storage space on a keyboard, or on this particular keyboard. So the thing is, gamers in particular like mapping LEDs and doing fancy displays and like having multiple key maps. So to store that, what they now do is they put chips in for storage, for little flash chips. And flash is interesting because it's very, very expensive to have small flash chips. So now what they do is they go and put 4 meg flash chips in these things because it's cheap. Now, 4 meg is a lot of characters you could log to, and you could write to those from the controller. So in theory, I could log everything to non-volatile flash storage and leave it on there. So even if I can't convince you to type my magic key in to get all your secrets, I could just come and borrow your keyboard or steal it or have someone else steal it or ask for it to come back for, I don't know, security reasons or something like that. And hey, presto. So how do you uh, protect yourself from this kind of thing? Well, it's simple. You go and stick hot glue in all your USB ports. Um, no, seriously. Well, you say that. So the interesting thing is, um, IBM ThinkPads or Lenovo ThinkPads also use a Sonics SN32 or SN8, depending on the model of key, as their keyboard controller for the laptop keyboard. So in theory, you could reprogram that inside of your laptop and still do all the key logging. And yeah, good luck getting that replaced easily. And so like I said, this is a, it's a sort of a complicated one. How do you, you can't secure yourself against this. It's gonna be an auditing nightmare, so please don't go and tell your compliance people that this thing's possible, because I don't wanna to have to explain to some poor guy, you know, uh, look, yes, it's possible, but you know, only worry about the nation states, don't worry, you know. No one's going to do this for our information. But yeah, so that's it. That's my talk. Um, you can find me on, well, what was Twitter, at Dale underscore nuns. You can find me on LinkedIn or on um, Mastodon. Uh, all of this will eventually land up getting written up on my website, xor.co.za. Um, the slides will be there as well. I will release my uh, fork of QMK Sonics with all the key logging. Um, if you guys want to play with it, just don't call me when you break your keyboards. Um, otherwise, like I say, I will eventually get those Red Dragon, the chip on there, reverse engineered. Um, it, I have to now. I own three of the three different Red Dragon keyboards, all of which are lying in pieces on my workbench. I don't think Take a Lot's going to believe me when I send it back going, I didn't do anything, I promise. So, yeah. Um, for those of you doing the scavenger hunt, um, there's a code also. Thanks very much for coming to my talk. If you have any questions, fire away.
yes, some of them you can. Um, I haven't. So uh, the Sonix ones, yes, because they support SWD. So they haven't locked the they haven't locked the firmware or anything. So if you've got an SWD programmer and you know the pinout, you can actually dump the firmware on them. The the other ones, I'm not sure. The the WCH ones use some weird wacky programmer that I don't have. Um, so I don't know how dumpable they are. But uh, yes, so the ARM-based ones are relatively easy. Assuming they haven't locked it, you just need an SWD programmer, figure out the pinout, and you can dump them. And then you can reverse engineer. And it's, it's ARM code, so it's relatively easy to, to reverse engineer. Um, it becomes problematic when it's like 8051s or some obscure thing that no one's heard of. Um, and that, that's the frustrating part about doing this, is a lot of times it actually probably is an ARM or something nice, but you can't find anything. All I can find is you know, some sort of gibberish thing on some random site where they happen to mention it, and you're sort of looking there going, squinting, going, that might be ARM. I don't know. And that's all I know about it. So uh, yeah, it's, like I say, tea leaves seem to be the way you figure this stuff out. Any other questions? Yes, so I know my talk title promised blinking of LEDs. Um, because of time constraints, um, I didn't get the LEDs blinking on this one. So currently none of the LEDs work. But in theory, and I played with it on other devices, is because you, you can toggle all the LEDs and stuff like that. Um, some keyboards have speakers in them now. This is supposedly a thing. Um, so you could probably um, send it via audio out as well. Um, also, the interesting thing is um, you can send other commands. So there's people who, on certain custom keyboards, they've implemented uh, MIDI over the USB so you can play musical instruments and stuff. So you literally just put in a key combination and switches your keyboard into MIDI mode, and now it's a, a, you know, music and stuff like that. Um, you can do anything. So there's people who've written mouse control software. So you can control, a, uh, you can control your cursor and pretend to be a mouse from your keyboard. It doesn't do it through Windows or whatever. This, something I didn't mention, is this hack will work on a Windows machine, a Linux machine, Mac OS, you name it. Anything that supports the USB HID protocol, technically, I can catch all the key presses, as long as you're typing in on my keyboard. Um, and so, like, you could write something that just catch the stuff in between. Uh, I was looking originally at implementing as much of the stuff that the little USB rubber duckies do. I was looking to see, could I port all of that onto these? And in theory, you could. Like I said, it's time constraints. It's, but you could basically turn a full keyboard that is physically unmodified into a USB rubber ducky, if you wanted to. Um, and that's why I said like, it, it starts getting a bit interesting then, because you can do all kinds of cool things like this. No, one can no, no one's going to notice. I mean, you can pass it through an x-ray machine. It doesn't show up. You can look at the thing until you actually analyze the firmware. You're not going to know that it's different. And you can do all that just through the USB connector. I'm taking this thing apart just because I had to map out the keyboard. But otherwise, you don't have to take it apart. You can do all of this over USB. And so now, if I want to do like a proper fancy attack, well, what I do is I find out that Stephen over here has ordered a new keyboard on Take A Lot. And I just go and grab the take a lot driver just before he shows up, offer the guy 100 Rand and say, hey, give me that keyboard for five minutes, thanks. Plug it into my laptop, reprogram it, put it back in the box and give it to Stephen. As long as I've been reasonably, got reasonably good paper craft skills and you don't notice that I've, you're not gonna know. And that's the thing, it's like, that's how this whole thing works, is you're just replacing the software. You can x-ray it, you can take it apart, you can inspect it. You're not going to know. Your supplier might not know that the software's been changed. So, you know, you, you just have to catch it somewhere in the pipeline of landing up at the customer, and you swap the software. So maybe it's a fun idea for Expo at a later stage, but the USB devices, like you said, you can do a mouse, but it's all different endpoints. So you could set up the network endpoints, <laughs> the HCP, and then just take it all over the internet, and then make it disappear. Yes. Yes. 
that, I think that gets done on the one, rubber duckies. One of those things do that, something like that already. One of those devices do it. I've seen it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Very vulnerable. Oh, at least yeah. some of them. Yeah. And like I said, QMK, I just used it because I don't have to code. Yeah. Like, I, I literally added two little bits and I can log all the keys. Yeah. Um, there's actually people who do this. Um, so I didn't know that, like, um, typing speed is competitive and people are, like, big into this thing. So what a lot of people do is they log every key press so that they can build these things that show which keys are being, like a heat map, which key is being pushed the most. And then based on that, they can rebuild the keyboard so that they um, increase their typing speeds. Um, they, they, this is the problem. It's like there's a whole rabbit hole of things. This is why my talk isn't as fancy as I would have liked. Because you start Googling these things and then you get into this rabbit hole of, like I say, YouTube videos I've watched way too many things about people making custom keyboards now. And I've read way too many articles about like custom keyboard building and stuff like that. I'm never going to build a custom keyboard. But I have logged many, many hours of careful study of them uh, and that. I still have no idea what the difference between a blue and a red and a green and a purple switch are. Um, they all just go clicky clicky as far as I can tell. But you know, that's it. Cool. Cool. If, otherwise, if you want to chat, come find me.